we need to stop asking transgender people whether or not they've had the surgery. Right. Right. First off, it's nobody's business what's between my legs or in my pants. Yep. Yep. Except someone who I choose to share that part of my body with. Yeah. And and when you meet somebody and the first thing out of your mouth is, have you had the surgery? It's like, okay, A, I've had six surgeries now. Yeah. yeah. It's not a surgery. And unless I can ask you about your genitals, mine are off limits. Yeah, absolutely. This is Dr. Alan Matu on The Psych Show. Lore, welcome to the show. Oh, Ali, it's awesome to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, I, it is it is my pleasure. Um, what would you like to talk about? How can I help? Well, um, I think you know my uh, area of expertise um, is working with transgender people. Mm-hmm. What are some of the ways that psychologists need to be paying attention to how they even develop a relationship with a client, whether they're trans or not. Hmm. (sighs) Laura, I was just filling out my paperwork. Um, I just recently moved from New York to California, and I'm in the slow process of transitioning all my health care to new health care providers, which is... Uh really difficult. Um, but I was just filling out paperwork for my new dentist and the gender options were binary, male, female. And I I think when it comes to building a relationship, uh, with the people you work with, it starts with that. It starts with something as simple as having, um, affirming, inclusive paperwork communicating in a affirmative way that you're going to be welcome here or that i even have some sense that i have an internal job that i need to do so that i can see you yeah i am in the middle of reviewing an article for publication Mm -hmm. and it's all about uh trans youth of color trying to be seen in the healthcare setting yeah, and how so many people who responded to this research study said they'll deal with three weeks of the flu rather than go see a primary care provider. Hmm. Why do you think that is? Because they know they're going to be misgendered. Mm -hmm. They know that there's not going to be any effort uh, on behalf of the people in the office, including the f- provider, to see that person for who they really are, to use the right name, to use the right pronouns. Right, right. And it, it, that seems so basic, and yet it, it that is the hugest, in my mind, stumbling block for people even to be able to start to think about having, and I'm not talking about a capital R relationship, mm-hmm. about having a relationship that's built on trust and respect. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I completely agree with you. And um, one of the things that I've I've learned through a lot of our interactions and our conversations and our discussions and for the people who are listening to this, um, you not only are we friends, but we're colleagues and um, you have a expertise in um, in a wide variety of mental health areas. You're also a psychologist. So if people are wondering (laughs) where this conversation is coming from, it's coming from years of friendship on on these issues. But one of the things that I've learned is not to make any assumptions about someone else, their identity, their experience, how they uh, like to be referred to. So uh, just as a general practice, I ask people that I work with, um, how do you identify? um, How would you like to be referred to? Um, And in an initial meeting, I'll also ask people, how have these experiences impacted your life, whether it is related to gender or culture 
or immigration or or moving across town or changing schools kind of asking about um how has this impacted you one thing i'm realizing lore is i haven't i haven't talked about gender gender identity and sexuality too much on this channel can i can i run some definitions by you yeah. to benefit people yeah. and see if this kind of yeah. if i have things right one of my favorite examples comes from genderbred person um uh-huh. And I found this to be helpful when I'm working with a lot of parents. And um, mm-hmm. so the the, the idea is, um, or the, I'm, I'm kind of imagining the poster in my head right now. And so yeah, gender yeah. identity is sort of um, what you think about in your mind, um, how you think about yourself. And this mm-hmm. can be, um, it, it's we're talking about a spectrum here, or also non um, non um, um, uh, non non binary as well. Thank you. So, gender identity is how you sort of think about yourself. Gender expression is um, how you show yourself to the world, um, how you express yourself, both in terms of your clothing, but also um, your behavior, your actions. Um, what everyone else sees, um, right. uh, uh, sexuality and attraction is is what you feel in your heart and uh, who you love. And again, this can be there can be a spectrum here, and also can be non um, non conforming. Um, and then um, there's um, um, sexual the characters, biology piece, the right? Biology piece, which is about gonads and chromosomes and i mean we we can all see at least our external gonads but nobody gets their chromosomes checed i have no No. idea what my chromosomes are right and and there is much more diversity there yes there is and that's a whole other conversation right yeah right and unfortunately it seems like when conversations about about gender and sexuality uh, come up, that's what people get focused on the most is biology. Yeah. However, however, so much of this experience as it relates to gender, gender identity, and gender expression, it's about these other things that uh, people rarely ask about. Um, and by people, I'm, I'm talking about healthcare professionals. I started seeing a patient uh, a week, week and a half ago who uh, came into our clinic because they were looking for a post-rape forensic exam hmm. um, and reported that their husband had raped them. Hmm. And so I was you know, trying to work through all kinds of resources for this person and um, the second time I met with her, uh, I asked her what it was like to be talking to me. I look like a guy. I know you guys all can't see that out there, but I look like a guy who's always been a guy mm-hmm. about something that's so deeply personal. And on uh, Thursday, Wednesday night this week, um, I had a chance to sit uh, over dinner with a fellow uh, employee who works out of one of our other clinics and and her whole job is about making sure that people who have been sexually assaulted have access to the kinds of care and services that they need and and when I explained to her that I had made this comment about what's it like talking to a guy she says I've never heard anybody say that they ever do that hmm. with a victim of rape and so this hmm. isn't just about gender identity stuff it's about you know so many ways that we interact with others present ourselves and uh, you know my hope is that in working with this woman that she's able to see that not everybody out there is a jerk Mm. being polite uh and, you know, we'll treat her with dignity and respect. Yeah. The same thing transgender people deserve. Yeah. Dignity and respect. That's something that as as um, as 
people and mental health especially, it's so important to check in with the people we're working at working with and just asking them what what is this like? Um, something I like to ask often early on is how is this going? What's it like to work with me? And sometimes you might ask that question and it can sound like, oh, this is so much about me. <laughs> like, I want to tell me what it's like right, to work about right. me. But it's, <laughs> it's not like a, it's not an ego thing as much as it is yeah. a, I want to see how I'm doing. Is there anything I can do to improve? Is there anything I'm missing? You know, so many times I reflect back to people what I think I'm hearing and I'm completely off. I'm completely wrong. Yeah. Like we're humans, but by checking in, you're you're communicating to the person. That's I really care. I get that we're two people sitting in the same room and we've all heard the same words. But what you said and what you meant and what I heard are three different things. Mm-hmm. Right, right, right. <laughs> um, and how as, do you triangulate that? Right. Right. Um, you need trust to be able to have those conversations and you need to be able to own mistakes or misunderstandings and uh, work to repair it and work to make things better. It It's it's like any other relationship we have in life. Um, you can't get anywhere without the trust and the trust allows you to have those conversations that are a bit more vulnerable and difficult. Yeah, exactly. As a cisgender male, someone who everyone identified as male and who also identifies as male. Um, I've had a few experiences in my life where I have been misgendered. And I, I just want to share this because I think it it can help other people who might be cisgendered and want to be better allies to the trans community. Um, so, Laura, you've known me um, for a long time. And you've also known how to pronounce my name for a very long time. Um, I, I think the first time we met, um, it was at a, a get-together for an American Psychological Association. And I might have introduced myself to you or someone else introduced me to you. Um, like it was going around in the room and everyone said each other's names. But what what has often happened in a lot of situations, this happened to me in um, in grad school when our cohort was introduced to each other over email, everyone thought I was female. Um, every, everyone thought my name was Allie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this has happened to me many times in my life. The, the most salient example, salient is my favorite academic word to use. Um, <laughs> the most salient example is I was in seventh grade, a time when no one feels comfortable about their identity or their right. bodies. Right. And right. Um, it was ele uh, middle school. Someone, um, we had an overhead announcer or, or overhead speaker where if there was a message from mm -hmm. the office, they would put it on the speaker so everyone in the whole class would hear. And um, my brother was coming to pick me up for a doctor's appointment. My brother was much older than me, so he kind of would sometimes pick me up for these kind of things. And um, the the front desk person from the office said, Mrs. Best, please send Allie to the office. Her brother is here to pick him up for an air uh, for uh, pick her up for an appointment. And the whole class started laughing. Everyone was laughing. And I felt so embarrassed. Completely mortified. Yes, completely mortified. When I guess misgendered, it doesn't happen often, um, and it doesn't have the it doesn't have the emotional impact that um, it it does for someone who who is trans and misgendered often throughout the day or um, intentionally misgendered. Like it, it it's very different for a cis male. Like I I understand that. Um, but when it happens, I, I'm reminded of that. It, it, you mentioned respect. Um, mm -hmm. it, it feels very disrespectful and very humiliating. Yeah. It's interesting. When I was applying for internship on my CV, I wrote Mr. Lore M. Dickey. Mm -hmm. And my training director said, you don't need to do that. Mm. I said... Do you want me to list the number of times people assume that the name Laura is associated 
with someone who's female mm -hmm. and how I don't want to create that misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to show up at an interview and they're expecting a woman and in walks a guy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That just is awkward for everybody. And she's like, Oh, okay. I get it. I mean, she's super smart and astute and can figure that out. But, um, yeah, I mean, I get misgendered by my voice because it's not very low. Mm. I get misgendered on the phone a on lot. On the phone, yeah, yeah. As people who really care about this and want to create welcoming, inclusive spaces, what kind of things have you experienced as as a psychologist, but also someone who uh, navigates healthcare and talks in the phone and all of these kind of things. What kind of things have you found do make a more welcoming, respectful place? Well, the first thing is when you make a mistake, that's not if. Right. Right. When you make a mistake, apologize and don't make the apology bigger than the mistake. Oh, that's a great way to to say that. And people can easily do this whole stumble over themselves. Oh, my God, I can't believe I did that. Well, I've known you all this time, and it's really hard for me to do this. And as, as someone who transitioned almost 21 years ago, I still make mistakes right. with my patients. Right. And to sort of, I don't know, uh, buck up and say, I'm always going to get it right, that's just not a reality. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I think as <laughs> here was something interesting. I don't remember where I was recently, but I, um, oh, I was at the hospital to get, uh, a radiological procedure done mm -hmm. and they had a little card at the registration desk that said please every appointment if your gender identity is not the same as the sex you were assigned at birth let us know every time you have an appointment we don't want to make any mistakes hmm. and so I told the I told the registration person I won't say what I said there because I know you'll have to edit it out <laughs> I said this is really awesome <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, you can figure out which word right. you would have to edit out. But, right, right. <laughs> um, I, I said, I've never seen this before, and I love that it's here. And I want to tell you that I was assigned female at birth. Yeah. All of a sudden, she started using the wrong pronoun. Huh. You know me, Ali. I don't look like I have a female history. No, no. And and I was just like all of my excitement about seeing that card there wow. was gone. Wow. Gone. Because she decided that because I said I was assigned female at birth, she needed to use female pronouns. Hmm. You know, I'm not the one who looks like a fool when somebody makes a mistake. Right. Um. So, so that's one of the things that I always tell people. The other thing is uh, when I train people, and I do a lot of training of folks, I'm getting ready to go on another trip next week to Dallas and Oklahoma City to do some training. Um, I always model the ways that I make mistakes hmm. because then they feel like, oh, it's okay for me to do that too or mm -hmm. to admit the mistake. Right, right. It's almost like we make the mistake and we're not sure what to do with ourselves. And if we do nothing with ourselves, that doesn't help the relationship. One of the first decisions we make when we meet a person is what is your gender? Yeah. And we are often wrong. You're giving a lot of permission to make mistakes to repair and learn and then move forward. Yeah. Um, 
something I found in a lot of my work with young adults, um, so people who are teenagers and in their 20s, there's also still a lot of identity exploration. Like I figuring out who you are and not understanding your identity, this is a normal part of, of being a young person. And yeah. I've, I've worked with a lot of trans for that to be no, right, 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 right. <laughs> it's going to happen. It's Spoiler. Puberty. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> so I've worked with a lot of people who have um, been exploring their their gender identity, their sexual orientation, and have been unsure. And it has been um, it feels much more fluid because they're they're just not sure. And there's been times um, when I'm working with people, especially if it's over the course of a few years, where um, they have changed their pronouns and their um, their pronoun preference, or their um, how they understand themselves I'm has gonna changed. I'm going to stop you for a second, Ollie. Yeah, yeah. I don't prefer pronouns. Mm-hmm. I insist that you use the pronouns that are consistent with my identity. I prefer, as Annalise Singh would say, cream in my coffee. Right. I don't prefer that you use the right pronouns. That makes sense. That makes complete sense. And that's and so this is what I'm kind of getting at is I, I so appreciate you sharing that with me because now um, now I know. And I know it's not your obligation to have to correct me and teach me. And at the same time, I value our relationship and the trust we have in each other so we can have that conversation. Yeah. And that's with my with my patients when there is this exploration, I've made mistakes um, especially if you're my 4 p.m. patient, my energy level is very low <laughs> at 4 p.m. Yeah. And I work very hard to try to make sure that I can, I can work around that, but I make mistakes. And so if there is that trust, you can work through those mistakes. And one thing that gives me hope, I don't know if this is your experience, but I find that, um, people who are, um, below their thirties and below 25 and below 20, there's such so much more of a um, a comfort, um, and this is not true for everyone, but there seems to be a bit more of a comfort of having these conversations and, and discussions yeah. that I don't yeah. think is around when I was younger, or even oh. even when you and I first met um, about ten years ago. The the world of um, just the language and the comfort of, of language. Like, I did not know what cisgender meant for... Uh, I, I think I learned that term probably in 2014, 2013 or 14. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so I think language is evolving. I think culture is evolving not as fast as we wanted to and not in all places, and it's rocky, but um, I feel like things are getting a little bit better at the same time there's a lot of political challenges a lot right. of legislation fortunately i think we've moved away from the bathroom bill era right, um, right. But the proponents of those bathroom bills would say that the people who are at risk in the bathrooms are women and children mm. but that's just not true the trans women are the ones who are at risk in the bathrooms yeah and you know, if you look at the the data around who's murdered, more often than not, it's a trans woman of color. Yeah, yeah. And the first trans person in the year 2020 was murdered on New Year's Day. And I remember posting on Facebook saying, I guess we're starting to count today. Hmm. Uh, this is the challenge of the time we live in uh, where just in my lifetime, I've seen so much progress and I've also seen so much heartache and uh, what feels like monumental steps backwards. Um, yeah. And we're seeing both of those things play out, I think at the same time. Um, it's interesting. A, a trans woman of color in Puerto Rico was murdered, I think last week. And there've been, a bunch of messages on some listservs that I'm on one a psychology listserv and somebody reached out to me and asked if I would be willing to um, 
sort of push the people who are talking about this to do more than give lip service to how sorry they are that this person person's life ended so violently. And it took me all day to get up the courage to say, I don't have the bandwidth for this. Yeah. yeah. This needs to be an ally who's pushing other allies to do the work. It doesn't need to be somebody who literally cannot read these messages because of how much it hurts to do so. Yeah, this is um, this is a thing about those of us who work with and are passionate about communities that we also identify with is when we read news stories like this, it impacts us differently. If you are um, a trans person and you're reading about... Um, horrific traumas and murders and violence that is being um, waged against the trans community, it is traumatic. It can be traumatic for you, or it can bring up past traumas you've experienced. Same if you're a person of color, same if you have, if your family are refugees. In so many ways, this stuff can bring up things that are um, that are invisible inside that no one else realizes, but can um, really paralyze you in so many ways. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the the thing I want us to end on is how can <laughs> well how how can we all be better allies? to the trans community. Um, there's there's one question I had for you. Um, I know that's a big okay. question. That's a very, very big question. Pronouns and email signatures? Oh, I wasn't even going there. Um, I was oh, gonna, okay. I was going to go with something. It, it, well, uh, tell me more about that, and then I'm, I'm going to tell you what I was going to ask you. To me, that was something that uh, began... I don't know who started doing pronouns and email signatures. Mm-hmm. My experience of it has been that well-meaning cisgender allies have done that as a way to make it safe for trans people to say their pronouns. But then I feel like trans people feel like they have to say their pronouns because the cisgender person led with this. Mm-hmm. So it feels messed up to me. Mm-hmm. And I have a real love-hate relationship and it's in my signature it's like mm-hmm. i don't i don't actually say my pronouns i have a link to you know what are pronouns he him mm-hmm. so it would send somebody that way and um so i i struggle with that uh i understand where the um where people's hearts are in that I'm just not sure that in practice that it helps make the world safer for transgender people. You know what I have, um, and I have run into a lot of disagreement with colleagues, or I I shouldn't say disagreement, but uh, vigorous conversation, let's say, um, Mm -hmm. about about this. I am at a place where I, um, I, my default is a they pronoun. Um, and mm-hmm. this most often comes up in um, in writing, if I'm writing about mm-hmm. about someone or if I am in conversation and I'm talking about someone who I haven't, I don't know what pronouns, um, uh, what are their pronouns. And so I use, I use they um, because I think... And of course, that's now accepted in APA style. Yes, yes, which made me so, which settled a big disagreement I had with a colleague of mine <laughs> who, who was editing in a paper I was writing and they're like, no, you don't use they. And I'm like, yes, 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 you do. Um, so my, my question... You can also he- use lowercase letters to start somebody's name in the start yeah. of a sentence. Yes, yes. I know that's, that, that is something. That, that's, a, that's a big deal. Um, so, yeah. Lord, how um, my, my question or my my question comment is um, I really wish we had a gender neutral pronoun that could be universally used. I think that would solve a lot of problems here. But my, my question here is more about when we first meet people, 
how to be um, how to be inclusive and not you know you like uh, I'm I'm it's thinking about really a, it's a very very easy question Ali oh, okay okay it's you know you introduce yourself hi my name's Ali Matu hi Ali um, I want to be respectful of you could you tell me what pronouns you use okay okay I've and, yeah, go ahead. Especially when you're meeting somebody who who has maybe a more androgynous presentation. Yeah. You could add to that of you know, I'm not sure what pronouns you use and I want to be able to be respectful. Could you help me with that? The the one question I have about that is could that ever be frustrating to someone to consistently get that question? Or does that? Or, it could. Yeah. It could, except that they could also see that as this person's trying to join with me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's. Um, and the the other thing, and and I would be remiss if I didn't say this, is we need to stop asking transgender people whether or not they've had the surgery. Right. Right. First off, it's nobody's business what's between my legs or in my pants. Yep. Yep. Except someone who I choose to share that part of my body with. Yeah. And and when you meet somebody and the first thing out of your mouth is, have you had the surgery? It's like, okay, A, I've had six surgeries now. Yeah. yeah. It's not a surgery. And unless I can ask you about your genitals, mine are off limits. Yeah, Absolutely. But that's that's such a beautiful example that you give, because no one's comfortable with that. Um, no one's well, comfortable with is, in, having that conversation. So much, yeah. Well, yeah, and I'm so much more. Yeah. Than whether I have testicles. Right. This this gets to some of the limitations of me drawing from my experience. So as a person of color, I'm often asked. Um, where are you from? No, where are you really from? And, yeah, 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 yeah. you know, like for me... Uh, Campbell? <laughs> <laughs> right, my, my default is usually... Right? I, yeah, usually what I say is I say California. And then that yeah. really messes with people's heads. And they're like, no, 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 <laughs> like really? Like really, where are you from? I'm like, well, yeah. Northern yeah. California. Um, and... <laughs> And so, <laughs> getting, <laughs> I really like annoying people who ask you that. Um, but it's, it's a frustrating question to continuously get. And so, from my, from my life experience, that's, that's where my fear came up is, would it be frustrating yeah. to get that question? You know, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know what pronouns you use. Um, what pronouns should I use when I'm referring to you? Or when I'm speaking I to you? I, I have like two answers to that. Yeah. One is, much like when I made a decision to transition, I realized that a big part of my journey through the end of my life was going to be about educating people mm -hmm. about who trans people are and why we're not these monsters that we're often portrayed to be. I think... It's possible, and I don't have any research to support this, so this is just lore talking. <laughs> I think it's possible that people with androgynous or non-binary identities know that that's going to be part of the script. Mm. And, and I can tell really quickly when somebody asks me, about my life and my experience, whether they're trying to join with me or push me away. Hmm. So I, you know, I think the tone in how somebody asks about the pronouns, um, the attempt to ask about the pronouns without making a decision already about what they should be. Mm -hmm. So, uh, or using it ever. 
to uh, describe you, a person? Yeah, you, you're not seeing this, but I just kind of, my jaw kind of dropped. Um, I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, it is a chair. Yeah. It is it's not a, a human. It's a computer. It's yeah. a lamp. It's not a living being, and it's certainly not a human being. Again, yeah. I get back to that place of we all just deserve to be treated with dignity and respect. I'm not asking for anything special. Yeah. I'm just asking that you treat me the same way you would anybody else. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Oh, yeah. wow. Uh, Laura, we could keep going for hours. No, we could. Uh, I, would, and... <laughs> I would probably miss my bedtime. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Um, to keep resetting the, <laughs> the video. My camera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, well, uh, and, and oh, you yeah, know go what, ahead. Ali? I'm yeah. happy to have another one of these conversations yeah. whenever you want to do that. Yeah. I, you, you know, I have so much respect for what you do. And being able to, you know, kind of break down what psychology is for the masses is so important today because there's still so much stigma around the need to see a counselor, the need to, uh, st you know, struggle through depression, the need to not be able to figure out how to deal with all the grief you have. Mm -hmm. And I just love that you make this accessible to people. Oh, well, thank you, Lord. Thank I'm you. I'm the that... head of your fan club. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you knew you had one, but I'm starting it today. There we go. Um, well, and this was apparently the first meeting of the fan club. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for being on. Here's here's what I think we should do. Yeah. Um, um, if you're watching this video um, or listening to this episode, let me know what questions you have about uh, transgender health and mental health issues related to being transgender and questions about um, how to be a respectful human being, um, how to build inclusive environments that are welcome, welcoming to all people. Uh, let me know um, in the comments below and then I can take some of the best questions there or the most frequent comments that are that keep coming up. And Lore, maybe you and I can do another one of these and we can we can um, use those comments as a taking off point. Lore, thank you for your time. Thank you for being here. And um, as You're always, welcome. thank you for your honesty. Oh, wouldn't do it any other way. <laughs>